Thank you. I have two faithful members here this morning listening to me here at the venue. We're back at the venue, as you can see, some of the signboards, um, and I have the most faithful Pastor William and his son Brett, who's making all of this for us possible. So we thank you to 
to what they do for us. Now, just before we start, let's just, let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for a Sunday morning. Thank you for a day that you rose and have given us life. And as we this morning come and we minister on your behalf, your word, I ask Holy Spirit that you will be with us and that you will be the spokesperson that speak to your congregation, your church, here in Bethany. I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, it's been in some time since I, I was here, about five to six weeks, I gather. And last time I spoke to you about the kingdom principles. And I thought about the name and I thought to myself, maybe I must change the name to Let Thy Kingdom Come Part 1 and let this be Let Thy Kingdom Come Part 2 um, because I want to continue with where I, I left off um, I want to start there. So last time, I think what was important is we, we established uh, through the, 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 the prayer that Jesus taught his, his uh, disciples, uh, the Our Father prayer, that we should pray to our Father, uh, which is in heaven, and we said, hallowed be thy name. It's like, you know, we address him and honor him for we is, but also speaking to ourselves because we are the one that needs to make his name holy. Um, because he's already holy. And then I spoke more about let thy kingdom come and let thy will be done as I see it in my heart. Um, so I don't want to stand there. I just want to, re to repeat that. Um, I mean, we had John first saying in, in, John, uh, in Matthew 3 verse 2, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of a Jew and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Some translation say, uh, says it is near. And um, if you look at Luke 19, 21, 20 to 21, now when he asked uh, the, the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. So we, we establish that the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus is now within us. We are his kingdom. We represent him. He's the king. We are his servants, but we represent him. And John 3, 3, we said that if you want to enter into the kingdom, you need to be born again. You need to be born again, born of the spirit to come into the kingdom. And then only you can really see and experience what it is all about. When you don't do that, you cannot see. You don't understand. You don't, I mean, you don't even believe sometimes. Um, and, and you just hope things will happen. We spoke about that. Now, Jesus is the king. Isaiah 9, 6 to, to 9 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. He's the king. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isn't that wonderful? This is our king. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And we even see today, we're part of that, there will be no end. But because today, it doesn't matter where you are, across the world, everywhere you find his kingdom is alive in his people. Um, and so he goes on. In John 18, 36, I must also give you this, this, this verse. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. You can go to China. You can go to the USA. You can go in Africa. Everywhere God's kingdom is established in His church. He's not bound to borders and whatever. No, we are the objects, we said, of His church. The people that have been saved and be born again. Um, his church, I said last time, represents the objects of His kingdom. And I will come back to the scripture later. At last time, I never got to because my time ran out in Ephesians 1, where he says that we, we the church, we, we are his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I wish I can understand what this is. We are the fullness. We, whatever we have, we represent him in his total character and person. That is what he says. We are the fullness of him, everything about him, 
we are that. I thank God. What an honor for us to be like that. To know that God chose us. He chose us. And I've also stated that the miracles that happened in that time were prophetic symbols that the kingdom, in fact, did come. In Matthew 8, we spent some time there when Jesus came down from the mountain. He first healed the leper. Um, and then he also healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. And he healed everybody they brought to him that was sick, etc. And it says there, it happened so that it must be fulfilled what was said in Isaiah 53, where it says, by his stripes we were healed. By his stripes he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that was supposed to be on us was on him. And we can now be healed. I thank the Lord for that, them for that. In any case, today, I don't want to uh, continue with that. I want to come back to this second sentence of that prayer that says, Hallowed be thy name. This sort of declaration precedes the prayer for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. Now to experience a kingdom requires, as I see it now in terms of this, it, 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 it requires holiness from my side. Jesus teach us here that we address our fa- if we address our Father, we immediately must acknowledge that He is holy. He is holy. Hallowed be thy name. So we need to come with that. You know, I'm coming to not just anybody. I'm, come to the, I'm coming to the Father, which is holy. Now when you look back in the Scriptures, the first point I just then want to make today with you is that He is a holy Father. He is a holy God. And we need to know that. You can't just come there, you know, casual. You need to know you deal with the holy God. And uh, Isaiah 6, 3, in fact, says, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And I see that holy, holy representing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy is the Father. Jesus, holy, is the Son of the, of, of the living God. And the Holy Spirit by name is holy. Holy, holy, hallowed be thy name. If you read 1 Peter 1, it says, But as he, uh, as he who called us is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In everything course that you do, you need to be holy. As it is written, be holy for I am holy. And you can now refer back to Leviticus 11 and those verses. I'm not going to read them, but the fact of the matter is we deal with the Holy God. And if you want to enter and live in the kingdom, you must know you are on holy ground because you are where the King of Kings is and where the Lord of Lords reigns. And our Father is a holy Father. Now, holy, what does it mean? And I think we've heard these sermons or uh, explanations many times but maybe it's good to just look at it again and see how I see it from my side. Now, holy means that you are set apart for God. Not for anything else. You are set apart for God. Yes, you live among your family and your friends and a community, but as you live within that environment, you are set apart, from, set apart for God. You are dedicated to Him. You are sacred. You are severed. You are morally and emotionally being cleansed. You are blameless. You are pure. That is what we should be when we say that we should be holy. We should be holy. And I'm asking myself that question every day. Because where do you stand when it comes to this? Our conduct, therefore, should be fitting those who are separated to God. Whatever I do should be fitting. That is what people should see. And we must part company. We must go in a different direction. We must cease to be associated with anything that will take away His holiness. We must disengage and get rid of it. Because there are so many ways that we can get um, disinfected, as we can call it, even in this day. uh, Of today where we look at an environment that can infect us. But spiritually, you can also be infected. Because you are not running away from certain things that you need to disengage with. 
Now, going further, there's a guy, his name is Andrew Womack, and I want to uh, re refer to what he said. He said that holiness is a fruit. It is not the root. It's something that you bear. Uh, it's the fruit. It is not the root. So, in other words, living a holy life is not the way to God, but is a byproduct of being born again. So, yes, um, you need to be holy to be in His presence, but bottom line is it, it is it is your way to show to god i love you is to live a holy life you don't live a holy life to get god to love you he already loves you he already loves you but you know what if you live a holy life you will get his attention because you now engage with him and you show to him that you are serious about your relationship with the almighty god you live a holy life because you are motivated by your relationship therefore um, to him and that you want well, to show him father i really love you that is why i come to you and say hallowed be thy name and that is how i will live and come before you you are responding to the love of god rather than trying to get him to respond to you when you are living a holy life that is what mr vomack says not course but in any case so i quote him holy implies that he is exalted very important he is and is worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness that is what it means i want to repeat that that he is exalted and worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and in righteousness now the second point i want to make is that to become holy um, you need to you need to take it up as your responsibility to so live a holy life is up to you it is my responsibility to live a holy life you will not be forced into it it is my responsibility it's a decision of my will what do I do with my life when I engage with life with family with friends with church with the community with things that surround me what do I do it's a decision of my will it is what I choose to do with the things that I, I'm dealing with. It is my connect, living according to God's commandments. That is what it's all about. I need to decide, I want to follow Him, and I want to, that is my will. I want to follow you, Jesus, and nothing else, no one else. In short, holiness is doing those things that please Him. Yes, it will please Him, because that is what He wants. He's a holy God. And what you do with your time and with your actions, that's that you have to decide with time and with things you do. Lord, I want to please you. I, I want to look at what I'm doing now or not doing now. And maybe I must change that. And I must become a holy person to show to you, I really, I really love you. And I appreciate what you did for me. We need to reflect God's holiness that is very important. We need to reflect God's innermost nature. Now, in a Jewish culture, hallowed in Jewish culture show reference in terms of a name. That's what they say. Again, that you can go and Google. They reflect a person's character. Show the essence of his or her identity. In this case, when it comes to our Father, holy. Holy is the essence of, of the... the, the it's, it's, it's everything about him. Um, it is what he's all about. It is holy. So it reflects that of him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 says, Or do you not know that, now coming back to us, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought, bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You need to glorify Him. You need to come to Him. You need to show to Him again that you appreciate Him. It is, it is my decision. What do I do with what I have? What do I do with the Spirit in me? I'm born again. I'm a new creation. What do I do? Am I really a new creation? When people look at me, do they some, see something new? Or is it still the old course? and manifest do they see something that is different from what they are used to now very important another verse telling me that it is my responsibility hebrew 12 verse 14 a very well-known scripture it says pursue make every effort 
Now that is a message for Yaku. Uh, you know, those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, but Yaku, make every effort. That was one of his messages one Sunday to us. Pursue, make every effort to live in peace with all people and holiness. Make every effort to live in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you don't like this, you must maybe take your Bible and tear it out and throw it away because some people don't see that. They think, I can just carry on and I will see the Lord. This scripture say, says, if you don't pursue holiness, you will not see the Lord. That is what the word says. It's not me. No one will see the Lord. No one will experience what the Lord has entrusted or given us, our inheritance, the things that's supposed to be ours, you will not experience it in full because you, are, you don't live and you don't pursue holiness. Ephesians 1 verse 4 to 5, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. We are called to be holy from even before the, the, everything that you see around you or that other people saw before you was there. We have been called to be holy, to be holy and to be blameless before Him. And that is again for me, I need to come and say, Lord, my responsibility, and I will come uh, closer to, to, to the things we have to do specifically. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 also says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. God will destroy him. It is tough words. If you don't like it, take your Bible, tear that page out. And before you know, you'll only have the front page and the back page. But that's God's word. And last time I told you, I choose to follow the word of God. And if I can't uh, come to that point where I do that, I know I will be lost. That is my only direction. Follow him. He says, God will destroy me, your course, if you are not keeping this temple holy. Um, for the temple of God is holy, which you are. You are his temple. Th then uh, another scripture. Uh, again, pointing to me as the responsible person. It says in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, it's not like, you know, you maybe come and, come and get holy. No, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, sisters, people, the church, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, people don't see God's plan, don't see God's will for their lives. Why not? Because they don't live a holy life. They don't take their bodies and say, here am I, Chris, I am giving my body, my service, I will give unto God for His purpose. Wherever I go, when I go fishing and people talk around me and they talk and they, and they swear or whatever, I will not go there. They will see I don't laugh for their, for their dirty jokes because I am a holy person. In fact, there will come a point that I will even turn and say, you know, I don't, I don't talk like that. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of God. And, um, and we sometimes, not sometimes, we many times need to do that. Uh, we heard uh, a Sunday or two ago that people are using the name of Jesus in front of us. They just use it, and sometimes we don't say anything. I can tell you, if someone uses the name of Jesus in my presence, he will know that that is not what he's supposed to do. Because that name to me is precious. And you don't use it as a swear word or a casual word, because he is holy. He's a holy God, and he's my God. So, in summary, we are required to be holy, to live a holy life. We are sanctified by His Word, John 77. He has already made us holy by His Word, and we now have to live that. We have to acknowledge Him by living a holy life. Then, a third thing I want to, to do is to talk to you. I first said to you that we, we've got to do with a holy God. Secondly, we have the responsibility to live a holy life. But, the third thing is, is now how can you stay holy? And here I want to also refer to 
to a very well-known person, to Copeland, and I want to use what he said and what I'm thinking. I will combine that in what I'm telling you now. The first thing you have to do is to separate you from the world. You need to be, as we already say, set apart for his purpose. And the Bible warns us again and again that we should, there should be a different line drawn between, between me and what is the world. Now, I'm not going to talk about the world, you know. If I talk about the world, I'm talking about the sinful things happening in the world. Um, because with the world, there's nothing wrong. God made the world and everything in it. But it's what happens, the sinful things happening, the things that are against, that are against His Word. Those things are, the, pro are the, the, the problems that we need to address. So what, what this means is that when it comes to our thoughts, our actions, our words, our behavior, we should be noticeably different from people that do not follow Jesus Christ. People who are not his disciples. We should look like Jesus. When people see you or when they walk away from you, they must say, you know, this person was different. It's almost like I was in the presence of Jesus. Um, and that is how we should walk. The Bible says, as the one who called you is holy, you yourself should also be holy in all your conduct and manner of living. 1 Peter 1 verse 13. We should be like that and we should uh, noticeably dif different when people, what people, how people behave in the world. To be set apart means we're not living like the world. We're not thinking like the world. We're not sick like the world. Sick in the spirit, in, in, uh, in our, in our, in our person, our character. We're not broke like the world. Um, we're not without resources and power like the world. Not engaging in sin like the world. Instead, we are separated from the world and walking with God in His ways. You know, by, many people will tell me, you know, um, sometimes in services, that there's a brokenness. And yes, sometimes there is a brokenness. But people mustn't come to me and tell me, you know, I see a brokenness in your life, Chris. You know why? Because Jesus, I honor Him. He took everything about me that was broken and He healed it. He healed the brokenhearted. He set the captives free. I am, I am complete. I have His fullness. I no longer have brokenness in my life. I live in a world where things are broken. I live among brokenness. But me, myself, if I, if I do not honor God, I will say, I'm still a broken person. I am not. I've been made whole. You can be made whole. You can be a different person. You just have to believe what Jesus said about you. And don't boast about it. Be, be humbled about it. Because for me, it's a humbling thing to know that I have been healed. All the pieces of my life, things that didn't fit, He took it and He put it together at the cross. And He gave it to me when He said, It is finished. It's complete. My work is done for you, course, for, course, for you and for your salvation. Blessed be His name. Now the problem here is, when you look at if, how to stay holy, is the problem is, what are we we're being fed with? What are you eating? What, is, what feeds you? Most of people, and I myself, I have to watch myself, we are always sitting in front of the television. Some people always sit with their telephones, you know, cell phones, um, and uh, play with cell phones. And I don't know what they do, but they're always busy with that stuff. They're always busy, and they're not reading the Bible. I can promise you that. They're not listening to something good, most probably. Uh, and secular music. People, we do all those things. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying we have to watch out. You know, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Um, and, and the problem is with, with television and, and phones, there are so many things in that or behind that that is dirty and that will destroy you. It will destroy you. So we need to really think about how we engage what, what feeds us? Is it that stories, one after one, with one murder after one murder, one uh, immoral relationship after another, uh, over the television, even, you know, in our culture, the Afrikaans uh, uh, life, you will find that there's no more people dating and, and going out, and then they will get engaged, and then they will get, get married. No, it's, you know, we, I like you, and before you know, they, they live together, and... And that is, that is acceptable, before you know. Because that is what television tells you. That is what television, go and watch it. I know, I wa I've watched it. And I am, at the moment, I'm in sort of a, a fight with this because I told my wife, we need to get rid of all these stories where we see all these immoral activities happening on television. 
So, in this world, you'll see that sexual sin, violence, foul language, and drunkenness are sometimes even celebrated. That's why you find that in stories. While morality and Christian values are laughed at. It's making a joke of us. When you go watch TVs, they're making a joke of, of, of Christians. And they will also have a story there, uh, making, putting us in a bad spot. Those are Christians, and they are these fanatic believers who are stupid. And that is what television will do when it comes to Christianity. Most programs, because the people who sit behind that don't serve God. They, most of them don't serve God. They don't have uh, a testimony that they've been born again. And I'm not saying all of them, but most of them. And I'm saying it here out loud because that's the truth and that's a fact. And we are eating their rubbish. We have been fed by their nonsense over television. So please be careful when you watch television because this thing can ruin you, can ruin you. And when it comes to uh, unbelievers, many people have as their best friends, they have unbelievers. That's my best friend. Now, I'm not saying you can't have friends with unbelievers, but, I mean, my best friend is not an unbeliever. I will not have it because they can do nothing for me. I want to have friends in the church, people that can help me and that can feed me and that can bless me and that can build me and edify me. People who are in the world can offer me nothing but worldly things. And I, I, I don't want that so much in my life. So I cannot see how you can walk shoulder to shoulder with people who are living in sin and who don't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And how you can walk with them, you are unequally yoked. I mean, we also find that people are dating uh, 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 people that are not Christians. You cannot, you are playing with fire. You are playing with fire. You're going to set yourself up for failure when it comes to Christ and his kingdom. You're going to lose everything about his kingdom. You're going to lose your life because you will be lost before you know it. People will come with all kinds of promises. Also, when you date, you're a girl, you find this guy, you fall in love, and then before you know, you, you're with him, and before you know, he's going to ask of you things that you never thought you would give. And be on the watch out for those things because slowly things are creeping in. And television is feeding us with that's the norm. That's the norm. Sleep together is the norm. There's nothing, uh, you know, if, you, if you're different, you're old-fashioned and you're behind times. I'm telling you, I'm on time. I'm in time with my life. And that's how I see life. And I will not set myself up for failure by engaging with people li like that. You know, you should minister to non-Christians. That's the only thing you should do to them. Tell them about Jesus. And if they want to be your friend, they need to come with you and, and listen and repent, and maybe you can then carry on and being a friend. James 4 verse 4 says, If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Another verse in the Word. It's not my, my Word. It's in the Bible. If you don't want it, take it out. Throw, tear that page out and see what you will believe in the end. They will be left with nothing. So to constantly live a life that is set apart is challenging. Because you, you are different. People see you and, you and you are different from other people. Um, and you will also most probably be persecuted. Um, you will not most probably get the promotion because people don't like who you are because you're not part of them. They will look at their friends and giving to those who, 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 who live like them. I, I know I've been there. I, I, I worked in many companies and many times promotions didn't come my way in, at, at work. But you know what? My promotion is not from what I get at work. My promotion is spiritually, is in God. That's why I want to be promoted and I want to be with Him. Not that I want to have a higher position in the church. I just, my spirit, I want to be at the place, at the higher place where God wants me. That's why, where I want to go. That's my promotion. That's my promotion. John 17 verse 14 says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So I don't care if people think, and, and think of me like that. And in fact, Matthew 5, verse 10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see? I'm living in the kingdom because I've been persecuted. I tell you, I've been persecuted. Not openly, not like, you know, in my face, but when this, the time comes for who will be appointed, um, lo and behold, I will see someone else. In, in, my, in my time. And it doesn't mean if you get promoted that you are, you know, <laughs> that's wrong. I'm just saying there's a good chance of you not getting the position if things are equal. 
someone else will get it because you are a Christian and you're a threat to those who don't serve God and that because they are enemies to a certain extent. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So there are so many scriptures telling us that we need to move away and, and from what is happening in the world because the world is trying to capture you, put you in, a, in, in, in like in a jail. Um, it, it, the world is forcing us in a direction instead of us as Christians forcing the world in a direction. We follow after the world. What they do, we do. And you, today, sometimes you can't even see the, the difference between who is in the world and who is in the church because we're just the same. And it's time that some of us stand up and make a difference. Make a difference. Because we have been trans, we've been, uh, we, we migrated from, from position of darkness into his marvelous light. If you read 1 Peter 2 verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen race, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Colossians 1.13, you were, when you were born again, you were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. I am in the kingdom of God's Son. So I need to keep myself holy and, and separate myself from the world. So we were taken and lifted out of darkness. We were separated. We were severed. Now, you know, you can go back there. The devil can't force you to go back. You must decide to go back there. And, and God will not sort of keep you from going back because he wants you to choose him. It's your choice. It is your will. But you can go back and, and, and be on the watch out. The devil is going around and he's, he's like a lion. He's not a lion. And he looks at who can he now devour? Who can he get on his side? And slowly you're like that little... Uh, something, you know, a, 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 a fly that sits on the kettle and it will not get used to the, the heat. And before you know, it drops dead because it's getting hotter and hotter. And sometimes we don't see that, that the kettle is getting hotter and hotter. And before we know, we're lost and we're dead. Please, when it comes to making your choices, choose life, choose the word, choose Christ, choose holiness, choose holiness every time that you do it. So, in summary then, if you want to live a holy life, we must be disconnected from the world and his ways and connected to God and his ways. Even we humans, yes, we may say, I'm just a human being, you know, how can I? No, we have the ability, we have the power, and we have a promise because we're born again, and we even have a promise from Scripture that nothing will come to us that is too big for us, but God will give us the way out every time. Uh, that is what his word says. Every time is a way out for you. You can get out of it. So you don't have to stay uh, there. Please, please follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Ephesians 4, 24 says, But you must put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's another way for you to stay holy. Put on Christ. We also heard... Uh, uh, when it comes to the weapons, that's something else you do. But here I'm saying, first, put on Christ. Christ, that's, you must be clothed with him and his character. Um, that is the new man. Allowing the Holy Spirit to come into you so that Jesus can live through your life, a new life for you. Now I want to also just talk about holiness versus righteousness. Righteousness is something you receive when you're born again. It is what Jesus did for you. He put you in right standing with with the Father because He died for your sins. When it comes to holiness, that is your decision. That is how you live. That is the decision of your will and, you, and what you choose in life. Now to look at someone in the Bible that we can refer to, a good example of someone who separated him from the world, who chose to do something different than his past, let's look at Paul and what he says. Philippians 3, 4-10. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm also. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel, 
of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I'm blameless. That was Paul's past. Paul, he was a Jew, you know, in every sense. He was a genuine Jew by birth. He was direct from uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was from a tribe, Benjamin. It was an elite tribe in Israel. His family retained the Hebrew customs and spoke the Hebrew language. He scrupulously observed the external demand of the law and fanatically tried to wipe out all opponents of Judaism. And that was Paul. Paul was a clever man. He was, he was in a good position in his past. But when he faced Jesus on the path of Damascus, on the road of Damascus, or the path, the road leads to Damascus, when he faced Jesus, he turned around. And for many years, he went and to, to learn from him. He went into the desert. And he says in verse 7 of, of, of Philippians 3, but what, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as a rubbish. I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Bottom line is, Paul saw himself as a holy person, living in the kingdom, separated from this world. He chose to leave everything he had in the past behind, all his qualifications, his position, everything he left behind. In fact, you never read in the Word, in the Bible, anything about Paul's family. I, I haven't picked it up. Maybe I must go and get it from someone else. But I haven't picked it. It was like he was a man on an island, on his own, on a mission for Christ and his sake. And that is what Paul tells me. He tells me I've given up everything for the sake of Christ. And look at what Paul has left us behind. A legacy. The Bible, more than half of the New Testament written by Paul. Things we look at today described by Paul, explaining to us how to deal with issues of life. Paul, because he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit, learned from, from Jesus himself, and we can learn from him. We also saw that um, this man, even though he was this good person, he was a very bad person in the past, he was also engaged in, 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 in situations where people died because he would persecute. And you can learn from that. It doesn't matter where, you, where you're coming from, what your past is, what you did against. If you want to change, you can change today. You can start today and be that different person. You can start today and say, Lord, I'm done with all this, these things that is pulling me down in my life, that is impacting my holiness and my position in the kingdom. And, and I don't experience the fullness of you, as Paul did, to know you in all your glory and all your power. Lord, I want to feel, I want to see that. That is what I want for my life. And I'm really on this path in my own life that where I'm uh, from about two years back. I've decided, listen, so far, I've lost too, too, too much ground when it comes spiritually. I've lost too much ground and become like the world, do things like the world. I will be different even though I'm not the favorite person where I am, with my family, with my friends. I don't care, even in the church. Sometimes you offend people because you are serious about the things of the Lord. And, and they don't want to engage with you because uh, you will tell them, this is, this is not right, this is wrong. You know, there's no gray. It's either right or wrong. And sometimes we need to be that person that will speak into the life of people so they can find Jesus, find life, find power, find and see what the will of God really is for them in life. So you can start right now and understand God in His fullness and His glory. The second point um, that we need to do is when it comes to Live a whole life is to flee from temptation. Flee from temptation. And many of the things now, I've already said so, I don't have to stand long with it. Timothy 2, verse 22. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Says that. Flee from evil desires. Flee from them. 
God has given us the ability to resist any temptation that comes our way. We've got the power. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the one I referred to. When you are tempted, God will also provide a way out. out. Every temp- There's no temptation that's too big for you. And God will give you a way out. You must flee from that. He will tell you how to get out of it through your spirit. You don't have the spirit of God in you telling you what to do or telling you this is not right. This is not right. But if you kill that, that voice, it's going to stop talking to you. If you keep on doing the same thing and it tells you it's wrong, Chris, and you do it again, it's wrong, Chris, and, and again and again, the spirit will stop talking to you. That's a fact. And you will, you will move away from God and you will lose that salvation that you had. Before you know, you will be a lost person. This is not condemnation. This is in fact telling you to turn around and say, until here, up to here, not further anymore, devil. I'm going to live a life consecrated, separated for my God, for my Father. And that is my job to keep myself pure. It's my job to straighten things out and sort things out. And if anything that's displeasing to, uh, against, to God according to His Word, you will know it because the Spirit will tell you what it is. I'm telling you, that voice inside of you will tell you. If you look at Adam and Eve, they were responsible for where they ended up. And now we're also there because of them. But in any case, they didn't listen to the voice of God. They listened to other voices. They didn't flee from it. And what happened? Sin came into this world as we see today. And we need the Lord Jesus to come and cleanse us and save us in the end in the New Testament. We have a choice to let us, to, to cleanse ourselves. 2 Corinthians 7.1 We're temples of the Holy Ghost indwelled by the Spirit of God. So when our flesh rises up, the Bible says, crucify it. Galatians 5, 24. Crucify those things that is not of God. Do not allow your flesh to dictate your way, your life. Do not allow your flesh, those things that is normal to us, come and dictate to you because you have something bigger in your life and that is the Holy Spirit who is bigger than this fleshly thing that wants to bring me down and make, make me do sin. And you know what? Sin is not... Uh, Put it this way, to be tempted by sin. It's not a sin. Sin will will come and tempt you. That's not a sin. The thing is, when you yield to it, when you give in, that is the problem. When there are sinful temptations, you gave in uh, in the past to it, that is when it becomes sin to you. You will be tempted. It will be there. You will walk down the street and see something that that, uh, that catches your eye. You Maybe you're a, 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 a man, and here comes the woman, and she's not fully dressed, and you look at her, and something will see, hey, and before you know, you're there. No. Look away. Look away. Even though it's beautiful, look away, because there may be something in you that is not, thoughts that are not correct, not holy in front of God. So we need to make a choice. And these are practical things that happens in our lives. We need to look away from those things. Um, Pastor William referred to Kenneth Hagen uh, a few times already about the birds. Can, you, you can't help them flying over your head, but you know you can't keep them from making a nest in your hair. So please, do not make sin come and make a nest in your hair. Don't let sin come and, and, and infest you, come into your life. Keep it away, like a Joseph. Joseph had a choice. You know, Potiphar's wife, you know, she was a important woman so and she wanted him to come to bed with her but he said no i'm not coming and then she she took his clothes off him and he had to flee what did he do he fled he fled he fled from that temptation because he wanted to have a holy life and and the lord in in the end used him mightily when it comes to the history of of israel adultery Fornication and every kind of sexual immorality is an epi- epi- is in epidemic performance, even in the church. Even in the church. I know about churches where, where people are living together, not married, but they are in the worship team. They, they you know, they, they, even elders, they, they serve the, the Lord and it's acceptable. In churches that you will be amazed to hear the names. I'm not going to give the names to you. But I have seen people, I in fact was one time, I was on, in, on, tra- traveling to some other country, so I was international, and there were these people traveling international. And I saw them, and they were sitting in the, in, in, in the, um, in the lounge, 
and the behavior of those people, worship leaders in a big and mighty church, I tell you, was far from holy. They were drunk. They were drunk. They had alcohol. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't enough alcohol. I also drink a red wine here and there. But you will never see me drunk with that. They were drunk in that place. And when I addressed them, they didn't even want to talk to me because they were high and mighty. I, I tell you, even in the church, you find these things are creeping in. And then people come and, you know, people have the ability to hide these things and come and they look very anointed and sometimes they are not. Be careful. Be careful. Satan will not rest. He will grab. His biggest fight is against the church because the others he already overcame. But the church, if you can get the church to bow down, he's got us all. So flee from these things. Flee from these things. Today, people also, you know, and I know people don't want us to talk about it, but to get married and then get divorced. Just like that. One disagreement and we divorce. Easily. It becomes a norm. Um, and then you, know, you divorce, now you meet someone else, and people in the church, I know people in the church, they will get involved with other people and in, in, in go and sleep with them because they're used to it before they get married because they were there, they think they can do it again. No, if you are divorced or if you lost your husband, you lost your wife, and you come and you want to date someone else, you do it the right way. You go out, you get engaged, then you get married, and then you go on honeymoon. That is the way God works. That is to live a holy life. That is to honor Him. That is to say, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done. You have the right. You can now come with boldness to his throne of grace because you know you are coming with the right attitude and the right mindset in the right relationship with the one, the Almighty. And you can feel confident when you pray for the sick and you lay the hands on the sick and you say, in the name of Jesus, you will recover because you know you stand on a firm foundation. Stand on a firm foundation. The last point I want to make is to, to obey the Word of God. To obey the Word of God. That is what we need to do. And I, I think I've said enough of that already. That if you really love the Lord, you will do what His commandments say. John 14, 23 to 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our, and we'll come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my commandments. Obviously, he will not come and live with us. But he's living with me because I am following him and I'm separated myself from, from the world. So, in fact, then, we need to know the word. If I say that keep his commandments, obey the word, you need to know the word. We've heard that many times. We need to know the word. We need to know the commandments. We need to know the rules of his kingdom. We need to listen to the warnings of the Holy Spirit and he must follow it. Constantly follow it. That is the way to go about with our lives. And I want to finish. You know what I, I, I said to, to Pastor William the other day when he, took, when he spoke about holiness? I, I woke up one morning and I was, I was preaching while I was asleep. And I, in my sleep, I was preaching this word and, and about holiness. And suddenly I realized something in, in, in the New Testament where we had Caiaphas. Now, this is not me. I'm, I'm, I haven't studied this so much. This is, came to me. Caiaphas was, was, was the priest in the time of Jesus. And you know what? The priest will have to go every year into the holiest of holiest and make atonement for the sins of Israel uh, on Yom Kippur. That's a day making atonement. You know, and he was supposed to take off his turban and his rope and everything, only a white cloth with bells and uh, maybe a rope on his feet, and he will walk in. And if he went into that holiest of holiest, he will be struck dead if he go in there with a the wrong attitude and, 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 and filthy and whatever. Um, but Caiaphas, either he didn't go in there or he went in there and God wasn't there in that holiest of holiest. Why? Because sin has, t has taken over the, the temple. Jesus twice had to take people out of his temple. He wasn't even there anymore. That's why they could go in and out and nothing happened. Um, and that is why when Jesus died, when, when he blew out his last breath, he, we heard that the sun darkened, the earthquake, rocks were split, graves opened, and most important, the veil was torn from top to bottom, and the holiest of holiest opened up. But he wasn't there anymore. He was gone. And that is what can happen to your life. If you allow sin into your life, you, you know what? God is leaving that space. 
He's not living in you anymore. He will leave you before you know it. You will be on your own. You will be on your own. So, in last, in last, the end of, we need to pursue, pursue Christ. We need to clothe ourselves with Him. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh for the, to fulfill His lust. Romans 13 verse 14. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. That's all I want to know. I determined to know nothing. I beseech you, therefore, to take your, your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in, in His sight. And that is the way to go about. I know this is not an easy word to take in. Maybe it's a bit harsh for you, but you know what? This is real. If you are not living a holy life, if you don't see your Father as holy, you will not experience the kingdom. You will not experience the kingdom. You will not even understand God's will and His way because you don't live a holy life. That is, that is what the Our Father teach me. It starts with Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's all about, Lord, I need to, 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 to acknowledge your holiness so I can experience your presence. And I acknowledge your holiness by living a holy life. A holy life, holy and and uh, if you uh, read uh, right at the end now, I'm going to end up with this. But Psalm 51, 10 to 11, it says, "Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast away from me your presence, and do not take away from me your Holy Spirit." That is what it's all about. It's, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit to stay with me. I want to live a holy life. I want to live a life so when I come to people and I address them, they must experience Jesus and His fullness and His greatness and His power and His glory. And it, they can only do that if I come clean. I know I'm already clean by His blood. Yes, but there's also something else. I need to walk. I need to pursue holiness without which I will not see the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank You this morning that You have given us the ability to live a holy life because you've given us your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord. I can stand before you as a, as a human being but filled with the glory and the power of the Almighty God. So, Lord, let us see ourselves as, as mighty men, as powerful, not because of who we are, but of, because of who you are, because of what you did for us, because of what you downloaded into our spirit, Lord. Let me acknowledge your greatness and your glory by becoming effective in your kingdom, by making and acknowledging that you are a holy God. You are a holy God. Hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Blessed be the name. I thank you. I praise you. Amen.